All right. So uh, excited to talk to Mr. Mike Ellison, a relatively new friend, but uh, somebody who I feel like I've known for a while in some context, an entrepreneur, a musician, uh, a fighter of, of all things good in arts and culture, doing some great work in Detroit and nationwide. Mike, thanks so much for, for joining me and for talking to Music 2020 today. It's really great of you. Yeah, my pleasure, George. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. So a um, bunch of topics that I want to get through today, all related to what we're trying to do with Music 2020 and our mission really of trying to create a music business that is uh, has sort of more winners than losers. Um, I think we can all all agree that, that the music business right now isn't isn't working as well as it as it could be. And, and I want to talk through some ideas that, that you might have and your history, how you got here. But let's just start with just a short sort of bio from yourself, who you are, how you got here and, and, and what you're working on. Well, the, 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 uh, the cliff notes of my narrative, I was uh, born in Ethiopia. I grew up in Virginia, a small town outside of D.C. called Reston, and uh, exposed to music and hip-hop culture in Queens, New York, where I spent a lot of time with family and um, went the normal route, went to the University of Virginia, studied communications, PR, went to Detroit, worked in the field of sports marketing. But the, uh, the artist itch never left me, and... Um, the art and culture of Detroit transformed me into an artist. And, um, you know, I've been able to express myself in the, in the field of music, several genres within music, um, stage, uh, theater, film and television, um, poetry, spoken word, and uh, what I would consider a community outreach model. Yeah, I love it. And one of the things that I've gotten to know you a little bit that, that I so admire about your work is that it, it seems, and I think this is maybe a key point for, for musicians generally, and it comes up with a lot of the people with whom we speak, you don't seem at all encumbered by the sort of traditional boundaries or barriers with respect to what the definition of a musician or artist should be. You know, I know that you, your background is poetry. As you said, you've got uh, you know, expertise in advertising, marketing, you do all this stuff in the community. Talk a little bit about how or why that might be important. It, it, obviously, you can only talk about yourself, but how should artists be viewing the definition of art so that they can sort of expand out and get compensated more fairly and, uh, you know, all the things that we want? Well, I think, um, you know, I, th I think the, the standard model of the music industry, if we'll call it that, yeah kind of led us all to believe that there was there was one path and one mold and these are the steps you must do and this is what you should do and this is how you should do it right and I think um, so it limited our, our thinking in terms of what we could embody as artists and in, in totality yeah and I think it also limited our skill set right because the notion was that hey it's hard enough to just be a great singer or, or a great musician so just dedicate yourself to that let other people worry about the other things. Right. And that worked for a handful of people. But in the long run, as you know, the less educated you are about the other things, you're going to lose in the long run. Um, and I don't think it's reasonable, though, to think that all of us can master yes. all of the things that yeah. are necessary to bring your art to market. Right. And so I think for, for me, it really was a matter of necessity. Um, you know, the so-called industry, I was not really interested in what I was doing. Mm. Um, I have some thoughts about that and as, as some new things come to light about some of the nefarious aspects of the music industry and the proliferation of gangster rap in the place of conscious content. Hey, so, so I got to stop you. I mean, is it, I, I want to hear those thoughts, you know, and, and I'm sure you're leading, maybe you're leading up to them. I just don't want to, I want to at least put a, put a, a dog ear on that thought. So that we, you know, I, I'm dying to hear those thoughts, you know? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, I definitely I'll just say that for me, it's a matter of necessity and interest. I, um, I'm motivated by purpose and environment. Yes. I need a purpose that's bigger than my ego because, I, for me, I don't think ego is enough to sustain you through uh, some of the crap you face to, to be an artist. Um, and then my environment. I'm influenced by my environment. I grew up in a very small town. Certain things were limited. I knew what I aspired to, but it wasn't authentic. And then the more life experience I got in environments like being in Queens and then mm. ultimately Detroit and then traveling the country and then going to places like Ethiopia is when I, I think, you know, fully matured as an artist, which um, I'm still doing. Um, going back to your point, I think, you know, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that, um, and this is not to disparage any particular group or brand, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that 
the proliferation of gangster music in the early to mid 90s and from then on um, was intentional and in the in the the effort to neutralize groups like public enemy and other conscious artists that were influencing millions around the globe was deliberate oh man um, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that and there are a number of artists who lived it who can talk about it you, you can see the interviews on YouTube um, and when you look at how that coincides with mass and mass incarceration, the business model of private prison, uh, the, the private prison industry, a profit model, a profit motive <laughs> behind incarceration, where you have, you know, publicly traded companies, and then when you look at what you know, what was the mo what was the music promoting? Murder, misogyny, materialism. Unbelievable. So you know what I mean. Oh, I I, th I think I do. Um, <laughs> um, it's it's a deep and profound statement um, that is awkward for middle aged white dude to sort of comment on, right? Um, to be to be blunt, um, yeah. I I gave a speech not long ago, and um, one of the highlights of my career, life, whatever, was Chuck D tweeting, giving me a shout out on Twitter about it because I referenced Public Enemy in that speech. So, me, there's a lot of my heroes. Uh, it's kind of you. Well, they're my heroes too, and and so what? Maybe what you're saying, sort of related to what we're trying to do here, is like I don't know quite how to frame this, but the institutions or the institutionalization of the music industry by these sort of corporations or what have you had a very very chilling negative effect or what have you on on the output of creativity. And, and has led us to this place, and I'm making something up, so tell me where I'm wrong, led us to this place of, well, let me pause. I believe, and I teach ethics, I believe that anything that has been built on an a, a unethical firmament ultimately crumbles. And so you could go back to the United States of America and our great original sin, which I think is one of your phrases that I'm stealing from you, uh, of racism, and, and, and track how that's led us to so many of our, our issues now. Are you essentially saying something similar about music, that these institutions have led us to this place where the music business currently, for most people, is in just such a sense of disarray, or am I just making this reducted, reducted, reducing it to something stupid? Well, no, I mean, I, I think you're dead on, actually. Okay. Here's, here's what I say. I mean, I want to, I'll add a caveat to say, you know, I don't claim to be an expert uh, about anything. Okay. But I do try to look at things in very simple terms, right? So... The music industry, as you know, is known for following models, right? Yes, they yes, follow a model yes. for success. This is what a, you know, if you're going in this genre, this look works, and then you do these kind of things, and these publicity stunts, and this marketing approach, and then if it's successful, they kind of repeat it, right? Yes. So if we're going to use Public Enemy as an example, here's a group that was going platinum with little to no radio yes. play. Yes, yes. Right? So they're already successful, and they're not getting radio play. Um why didn't we see, okay, where's today's modern public enemy? I, I don't know. I, where is today's modern so, public enemy? I don't know. Okay, so is it Talib Kweli? I, I don't know, you know? Here's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I, okay, let's look at Rakim. Rakim, Rakim is the best. Is one of the all-time greats, period. Yes. Never cursed, never said the N-word. Yes. Until maybe on the song um, with Ju on the Juice soundtrack. Yes. Okay. Regarded as one of the best ever. Never cursed, never said the M word, didn't feel his raps about killing people who looked like him. Right. Where's today's rock him? I don't know. Aaron, where's Eric B? Uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's not there. So, so I mean, where, where's, where's KRS1, right? Well, that's what I'm saying is that, like, in other genres, right? Yeah. Like, the legends are in race, the Beatles, and people like they can sell out arenas, but then the, the people who pioneered this art form, you can go further back, right? Look at the message. Grandmaster Flash. Yeah, sure. Yeah. They were dealing with the struggles of urban living, but yeah. not in terms of shooting every nigga on the block. Right. Where is that? You can go further. Look at, like, you know, Lauren Hill, um, the miseducation of Lauren Hill. So did, did the music industry try to recreate Lauren Hill? Instead of Lauren Hill, we get ultra sexual, overt lyrics from Queen Man. Again, I'm not knocking any particular. No, I get it. I get it. But I'm just saying, like, you know, there are models for success that promote consciousness and self-love, and you don't hear it, you don't see it.
So, so let me let me take this in a slightly different direction. Even though I'm having to fight all my better instincts because I I could talk about this forever, but it it, it, yeah, it, it also yeah, sort of well, no, but it make it's it's it makes me so profoundly sad that it's hard for me not to just sort of get emotional talking about it. Let me let me pull it into a direction of of obfuscation because one of one of our tenets here is that that we need to redefine sort of radio and streaming services. In their relationship as business partners, and and I've long held a theory, and maybe this maybe this links to what you're saying, that that record labels, publishers, the institutions have leveraged their knowledge. I use a, a fancy term called information asymmetry. We know more about something than you do, and we're going to leverage that in order to benefit ourselves, right? So, I mean, there is a path that says we let sign this. Sign this paper, artist, and we will. But don't look at it. Sign it, right? And there, the, you know, and maybe that ties into this institutional. Because what you're sort of saying, and I don't want to use this word, but there was a conscious, concerted effort to sort of silence the voices of a particular type, right? Absolutely. Okay. And and go ahead. Well, and even some of the artists that you mentioned, Talib Kwali, yeah, most deaf, yeah. Paris one. yeah. Again, I mean, they'd already proven their their proficiency. They don't. You don't see them in popular media. They didn't get the push that other um, artists get. And again, I'm sure there are people are on the inside who can counter what I'm saying, and maybe they have insight as to why certain artists rise and why certain artists don't. But again, I go back to very simple things, right? And I'll, I'll try to be artful and not be offensive so that if people only catch snippets of this, they mm. won't miss it. Yeah, yeah, great. What other group of people do you know are rewarded and encouraged to sing about killing themselves i mean like bitch ass niggas just like saying hello in hip hop mm -hmm. okay so if you had an asian artist mm -hmm. have you ever heard them say i don't care what you think but i'll chop that blank mm -hmm. right uh you know uh I, I don't hear you know i mean i have jewish friends and and artists You'll never hear them use disparaging terms that folks use in racial contexts about Jews in their music. And then on top of that, talk about killing a fellow Jew in that way. I don't hear any other group. You can go down any. And by the way, I mean, I don't I don't buy into the notion of race. I don't like using terms race, class, creed. Uh, I think those are all divisive terms. But what other group of people do you know rap about killing themselves, disparaging their women? shooting up the block, I don't care, I wouldn't kill my own mother, blah, blah, blah. Who else does that? <laughs> no, the, I mean, I know, I know that's sort of a rhetorical question, but I, I, I don't have an answer to that, you yeah, know? I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm sure, you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet, so somewhere somebody said, you know, hey, I'll do well, this to you, but yeah, for I, the most part, it, it has never happened in history before, and it hasn't happened in history since, where you have a group of talented people um, and even the most intelligent and gifted among us still have to lace their albums with the prerequisite number of N words and B words and, you know, gun toting or what have you. So, so um, I'm with you and I'm sorry to interrupt, but so yeah. one, one, if I'm tracking this right, and I think I am, you know, there, there's, there's an input to a system, right? And then the system gets a hold of it and sort of dictates what, what, how to optimize that input for a, a, a desired output, right? Absolutely. One of our key tenants is, at Music 2020 is disintermediation, pulling that, that middle person, whether it's label, publisher, out. Because you said something so profoundly important. Public Enemy became platinum selling with little to no radio play, right? Pre press actually was sort of important, I believe, in their, in their, in their sort of uh, rise. But, but it was really somehow, even back in the 80s, pre-internet, fans found this. And they sort of found it, it's close to direct from public enemy to the fan with as few sort of intermediaries as possible. I believe deeply that, that we need to get back to or get to that place where Mike Ellison releases music and it doesn't have to go through all these, you know, chopped up these, these intermediaries, whether it's labels, publishers, radio or whatever, for me, George, fan, to not only find it, um, but also to compensate you fairly for the music and not have it get gummed up by all the people trying to tell you what to do. Is that is that at all? I think that's accurate, but okay. I also think that the same the same marketing push that you get um, for a major artist who's making party records, 
you've never seen for a so-called I see. I see. I see. That's okay. Even, even in the heyday of hip hop, you never saw any of the artists that we reference get the kind of push that let, let's say even the Tupac. Right now Tupac was a very conscious, right? But he had to give you thug life first in order to slide in some other messages. Yes. Yes, so yes, that you yes, can yes. Get it. But nobody who just says, "Look, I'm not going to give you any uh genocidal content." Yes. I'm yes. going to give you all consciously. Have we ever seen that artist pushed and promoted? Um, I think now you're seeing more of it with artists like J. Cole and, uh, okay. and Kendrick Lamar. Yes, yes, I mean, it, yes. There is there's some counterbalance there. And again, I mean, I, I never, I don't want to sound like one of those um, independent grassroots artists who's throwing stones at anybody who's achieved popularity. No, I, think, I think they all work extremely hard. They all make sacrifices. Everybody's entitled to tell, tell their truth. I'm just saying, give me balance, right? I, like, I hear you, but but I guess what I'm saying is, is, is it is that is that that tr that trend, for lack of a better word, the gen you use the genocidal phrase, um, is that because that is what the audience is demanding, or is that because the institutions have conditioned us to believe that's what we want? We've marketed it that way, and and is there a way? Another one of our tenets is a more egalitarian playing field. I don't want to hear music that is 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 negative in nature that is misogynistic i just don't want to hear it right um the latter is what is, is what you said that, which is we've, we've created this appetite it's like you know as a parent right i have a three-year-old yeah if i take him to eat fast food seven days out of the week he's going to start to crave it that's right right now he, he's pretty healthy right so i think it's a combination of I mean, that stuff is appealing to it, right? Sure I mean, is. the way the, the beats is a science to it, and, and the way the guys present themselves oh, is yeah, very yeah. appealing to a young mind. So you're going to develop that appetite. But uh, I go back to your, one of your heroes of mine, Chuck D, and he always just said balance. Balance. Just give me some balance. So to your point, I think it's a combination in the sense that we know that there is a machine that can make people famous and help make people popular and at least exposed. It doesn't guarantee success, but it does get mass exposure. So a combination of that mass exposure, which makes up up and coming artists want to emulate their heroes, right? And then and then an opportunity, as you said, to kind of remove the barrier between artists and fans, could have a very, um, for lack of a better term, balancing effect on the content that we're getting. Right, and and, and that goes to things like pay, payola and others. I mean, there, there's I've lived that, man. You probably have too. There, there's no, there's no confusion, disagreement of the fact that that when certain institutions decide that this is the song, they are going to find a way to keep banging that song through payola until the customer eventually goes, yeah, I guess that is the song, right? I mean, it, and 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 that that may be okay if it was done with transparency, where the customer knows that this song's being paid for, and et cetera. But what I really want is, is a more egalitarian world where, where you, Mike, can put together your songs, your playlist, be given a platform. You should have your own streaming service. There should be the Mike Ellison streaming service that I could... I, no, no, you laugh. But, I mean, I, 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 and I, there should be a George Howard one, too. There should be one yeah. for, for my daughter. It, 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 it should be, look, this is what I'm listening to. And and I've got my network of friends, call it a social network, if you will, check it out. And then there should be some way to compensate and lock those pieces together. Um, and, and, you know, people far smarter than I, Andy Weissman, who's a venture capitalist, says there shouldn't be five streaming services, there should be 5,000, right? And, and the only way that happens is through a technology like a distributed sort of blockchain type technology, etc. But But at its root, I do think comes back to your point of this this machine... Is, is filtering and dictating and determining what comes out the other end and market in that way and how do we strike that balance. So tell me specifically, and I don't want to, I want you to talk, tell me how, or at least get to how, what you're doing to get there and what we can do as an in entity, uh, as, a, as a business, an a, a institution, music business to get there. Okay, well I think, you know, uh, you made some excellent points. Um, I can only speak for me. Yes. The first thing I can say is that I'm a fan first. And I really feel like I'm a fan who became a musician by default. And, um, <laughs> you know, music for me became a way to serve and to do some public good. Mm. And so I've embraced that part of it. 
And so what I've done is just find ways to take music and messaging directly to the people and value whether I have 10, 1,000, 100 in that audience. And I've worked very hard to do that effectively and, um, you know, very proud of those efforts. Um, I think that people with resources and relationships can just do better by bringing artists who do public good to the forefront. So, so right? give uh, you're you're so humble, Mike. I mean, give I know some of the things that you've done. Can you can you talk about a particular project that you've done that exemplifies this? Do you mind, or is that putting you on the no, spot? I'm not, okay. I'm not. Like well, for example, um, I had written some poems about the tobacco industry, right? Like disproportionate advertising. And it was no profit motive, it was just me as a poet. Um, I was invited to a, a poetry slam last minute because uh, somebody canceled. And then as I arrived, someone shared with me that they had a tobacco sponsor on site and said, look, you know, we'll pay you double, just don't do that poem that you do about the tobacco industry, please. And that was the one and only poem I did that night. <laughs> and I fell out of favor with those poems. <laughs> I love that. I landed on a CD that I did made it to some folks. Long story short, I was invited to perform at a, a conference for the American Cancer Society. I had just come off a voting uh, registration tour with the NAACP where I was doing public relations work. We were using tour buses, going into cities, making a ruckus, registering voters, and getting press. So um, basically, you know, I went to the American Cancer Society and said, hey, we can duplicate that model, use music as a tool to raise awareness around cancer and fundraising and tobacco, the, ban the dangers of tobacco. We can supplement that with earned media impressions, which was a deliverable for them. Sure. We can also create some community coalitions. We can introduce you to organizations in various cities that are working to empower you. And so from that, we developed what, was, what became the Afroflow Tour, and that ran nationally for five years, uh, total seven years. The last two were a little more regional. Um, but basically where I use music and live performance as a platform to do community outreach and community engagement. And that was very successful. Um, I've partnered with the GM Foundation and the Music Hall Center for the Performing Arts in Detroit to address bullying and teen suicide through live performance, dance, and musicianship. Um, you know, the, the, the corny approach of don't be a bully, be a buddy, you know, that, that doesn't work. Just say no, Mike. Right. So we can <laughs> a little more hard edge and yeah. hard hitting. Right. Um, I've partnered with institutions like the Museum of African American History to do productions. Um, I've had a chance to work with more on the consulting side with the New York Knicks and help uh, take what was like a, their Reach to Achieve program, and which was the NBA's flagship program, where they would just go to school, read Dr. Seuss and go home. Um, a friend of mine who's no longer with the Knicks said, you know, what can we do different? As fate would have it, I was taping for HBO Deaf Poetry. She came and saw it, loved it, and we built on that idea and mm. partnered with some community folks and grew that to a 10-, 11-year program that resulted in you know students getting four-year scholarships to accredited universities all across the country. I mean, you know, so... You're not just talking the talk. You're walking the walk, and that's why I sort of prompted you to, to, to do that. Like, I, yeah. I know that... But you know your 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 viewpoints are so defined and strong and clear. But what's so impressive is you're actually taking it out into the world and doing it right. And and I it goes back to my initial point of like this is kind of the job of the artist today. Like if we if we def and yeah and maybe it's always been the job of the and it's not easy. So talk about that. I mean how do, what what is what is a better easier sort of music business look like over the next, you know, 4 years as we approach t 2020. You know what? I don't know, George. I think you're in that regard you're a smarter man than I. Well. <laughs> I mean like, you know, for example, all of those projects that I mentioned to you and I could go on to others require a tremendous amount of work and sacrifice yeah. and multiple skill sets. And I can't expect every artist to have it. I no. mean, I was fortunate. I went to a school like the University of Virginia. Um, you know, I had good parents. I had great siblings. I had opportunities that some of my peers, particularly young African-Americans, don't have. So mm -hmm. I can't say to somebody who is on Detroit's east side, who is aspiring but suffering through poor schools and underfunded textbooks to say, hey, you should do it like this. <laughs> And That's right. I don't mean to laugh. It's just so crazy, right? I mean, it's just. I mean, I it, it, Times, I think, who said they say my ghetto instrumental is detrimental to kids, as if they can't see the misery in which they live. So you know, 
to, to my earlier point, I'm not knocking so-called gangster rap or stuff that has a lot of violence and negativity. You can only talk about your environment and what you see. Yes. Um, but I'm saying that uh, I, I can't now proselytize to other folks and say, look at the route I went. You should do this, too. At the same time, there are artists who don't want to work hard. They think that mm. they should just be able to sit home, write a rap, and then be famous next month. And it's not going to happen like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think, you know, I mean, look, just because if you and I say we want to start a business tomorrow, just because we want to do it doesn't mean the universe owes us a certain amount of success. No. And just because somebody wants to be an artist and make songs doesn't mean that they should be guaranteed success. But I do think that they should be given a fair shot. Yes. I do think that their material, if it's conscious and open, people's, opens people's minds, should not be blocked by nefarious um, intentions. That I feel very strongly about. And I also believe that, you know, you look at people who have wealth, um, relationships, resources, and platforms, and they say they want to improve the world, and they say they want to give our youth a chance, but then what do they feed them? Mm. You know, not just literally food, but what do they feed them musically? You know, um, I I had a life-changing experience in Detroit a couple years ago. The the drummer I worked with closely, a guy named Chi Amin Ra, Mm -hmm. incredible percussionist, he took me, you know, he said, come on, man, you got you to gotta come to the Stephen Marley concert. You know, Stephen was, was doing a free concert in Detroit, and I had other plans, but he's like, man, you have to be here for this. And it was existential, man. Like, the, the vibe was beautiful. Strangers were hugging. People didn't want to leave. It was yeah. so positive. Yeah. And I said to myself, you know, if they really wanted to see a change in the youth behavior in our cities, they'd play reggae music. They'd play mm-hmm. Stephen Marley. Yeah. They wouldn't just play murder, 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 murder. Yeah, one you love, know, one love, if they, yeah. If they, if they say they want young girls, particularly African-American girls, to feel good about themselves and embrace their beauty, right? If they don't have long, light, straight hair and light skin, then they should be feeding them Laura and Vula. Yeah. Who my son loves, by the way. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, here's a, here's a beautiful woman who embraces... Uh, who she is and yeah. what she is yeah. in full totality. And you can see the value and virtue in it. And people with wealth and resources and relationships could say, yes, let's give young girls that. You, you know, I mean, I could go on. No, but, 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 but you, 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 again, you speak the speak and you do the do, right? And so I sit here and I listen to you. And, and as I keep saying, you know, and you said it too, a more, or ga- you didn't use quite this word, but egalitarian, you know, playing field. And wh- what's so cool about what you're, you're doing is you're doing that. Like you're setting up these dynamics and events in real time with stakeholders and showing yes. them that this is possible which is so much bigger and deeper and more profound than people sort of standing there and just talking the talk. Anybody can do that. Yeah, well, you do have to do it. I mean, I'll say, you know, the team of folks I've worked with in Detroit, like um, the past five years, we've headlined opening night for Concert of Colors. Yes. And what, what we've worked to do is not just make it a Mike Ellison show, but to make it a production with a central theme and to have an array of artists, established artists and brand new artists. Yeah. So like on one show and you'll see the and you'll see the breadth of who we are in terms of genre, right? Like a, a, a blues man like Robert Jones, an incredible singer like Stephanie Christian. But then we had two artists who are one technically blind, another visually impaired, but they had a story to tell, and then we wrap the brand around them and add context and tell a story through that. We address the history of um, Black Wall Street. I don't know if folks are, are familiar with that, but we address that through um music and skit and kind of an incredible actor named Justin Crutchfield. So Mm. to your point, I just try to work with the stage and the arena I'm given and try to share my platform with other artists um, and expose them to other people so that it it, it may help them. If if nothing else, they learn more about their own craft and how to perform. Um, But I've also tried to do it on a small scale and then present it to people who could help me scale it up. Right, 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 right. That has been challenging. Sure. We were were successful with the American Cancer Society doing that. The New York Knicks program, we scaled up. But, you know, like, for example, I have a production called Hard Enough to Smile that deals with the reality and the history of race in America. Mm. And it it starts with Noam Chomsky. Yeah. (laughs) Man, do I love Noam Chomsky. Yep. Right. But guess what, you know? Not everybody does. (laughs) (laughs) Or, or... (laughs) 
<laughs> story of my life, man. Let, let's start with Gnome. You know? <laughs> Right. When, 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 when you take a clip from Noam Chomsky that says, for a major population of African Americans, it's worse off than apartheid. Nobody wants to associate with that. Yeah. They don't want to tell that truth. You know, <sighs> what they they want to say, what is the latest, you know, booty shaking song that was going to help me sell more cars? But Mike, you and I both know, because we've both been doing it in various various ways. Your your work so much more important than mine that it's almost not even fair to, to equate it. But, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to be, uh, what do you call, self-deprecating. Uh, but we both know that anytime, whether it's a, a race, uh, innovation, cultural innovation or technological one, it's these little tiny incremental steps. And at first, and for a long time, you feel like you are screaming out into a vacuum and then over time things start to happen. And, and they do. yeah, I would, I would, seeing now because of technology that a lot of rappers look like machines. Yeah, no kidding. About yeah. Where you get shot yeah. and brutalized by the police, right? Yeah. You know, I just, um, so when you go back to what you say, what can we as this community do? I think the, the innovators and the people who have wealth, resources, and relationships can say boldly, we're going to take on the tough issues and we're going to be truthful about it. You know, I would like for us to be able to have the same open discourse that we can have about dealing with the Holocaust, which yeah. I've used in my um, productions dealing with bullying, <clears throat> going further than that, saying we just saw a thing today. Germany voted to uh, call the uh, the uh, war crimes committed against the Armenian people a genocide. And that has backlash mm -hmm. for them calling it what it was. The Armenian people have been fighting since the Armenian genocide for the world to just acknowledge it happened. You know, and I'm not even saying it's just a, it's only African American, but I just gotta get to the point where, look, we got one planet, one globe, we're all connected. I know it sounds cliche, but we have to deal with truth as it is. And 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 there is there is um uh, what's the word? There's a common denominator mm. in it in people being wrong and injustices being perpetuated mm -hmm. and our inability to address them and confront them honestly. Um, and I'm not saying every song should be We Are the World or Kumbaya. We all like the edge. We all like, you know, there is violence. There is sexuality. Give me the whole gamut yeah. and balance. Yeah. Um, but I would just like to see the folks who have those that wealth and resources get behind people who are out there um, is bringing some balance to the table. And I don't just mean myself. I mean, I, I could rattle off a dozen Detroit artists of whom I am a fan and whom I had to earn their respect for the right to call myself a Detroit based artist. Hey, and I want to talk to them. And I, I, want, to, I want to get more yeah. people that you think believe the things that you and I so clearly do about, broadly speaking, you know, the world narrowly speaking, music business and the art and people that, that believe we got to get some of these institutions out. We've got to create more egalitarian sort of playing fields. So bring them on. I, I The only way that I think we get there is to talk to more people and make this more vocal and get people like yourself, you know, the platforms to get the voice out there. Not that you need any help because you're moving mountains on your own, but like the more we bond together, the faster it happens, right? Yeah, no, I, listen, I definitely need help. <laughs> and, uh, Look, but I, we all need help. Yeah. But no, and I hear you, and I think you know, and, and I don't mean to talk in such generic terms. You're not. Yeah. I mean, I think you have developed some incredible business models, yeah. and I think you know, like uh, one of my favorite business thought leaders, Seth Golden, talks sure. about yeah. is that we, we have to collaborate. Yes, yeah, true. Because yeah. I, I'm not as proficient at what you do. Yeah, you know? build a tribe. And, yeah, and, and I'm not as proficient as my uh, percussionist, right, you know, right, 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 right. as much as I'd love to be able to express myself through the djembe or congas the way he does, <laughs> yeah, yeah. if I start doing that, then the other areas of my artistry will falter. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, um, as you said about, you know, with this platform you all are developing, it is a conversation about the producers yeah. and the fans yeah. and figuring out ways to, um, just to be, to be fair, yeah. to reward people. Yeah. But just because we want to do it doesn't mean that the universe owes us a certain No, I don't think the universe owes me anything. I mean, you know, one of one of my pet peeves is when people like post something on social media about how like, you know, either they found their car keys or they had a child born or they, they won the lottery and they do like hashtag blessed. 
And it's like, yeah, you know who's not blessed? Like the kid that's dying of a like I don't the you know, you, you know, and that's cool. And I don't mean to disparage anybody's faith or whatever, but like the I'm not sure which universe it is that owes any. You know, I mean, like it, it's not. So don't get me started on that. But but you know, gotcha. yeah. I with that though, yeah. Right? Because like my travels to Ethiopia. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing I want your audience to know, by the way, is that you know. Ethiopia is presented as the poster child for poverty when it should be recognized as the cornerstone of civilization, number one. And also that there is tremendous um, growth and success happening in Ethiopia and other parts of Africa. There are people I know who live better than you and I. Um, at the same time, the, some of the organizations I've worked with and supported, are they're doing the, the most good. Right. And so that brings you face to face with face to face with abject poverty yes i'm talking about abject painful palpable poverty yes and to be quite honest with you it's something i struggle with right because there are luxuries of living in america that 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 i've grown uh, accustomed sure to, almost addicted to right sure. um that i like and i love and then at the same time you come to know and love people who are suffering mm. and then there's this balance right like i'm not i'm not uh, warren buffett <laughs> and then uh, you know this so there's that balance of like okay how much good can i do mm -hmm. without depressing myself 24 7 and then how good am i to anybody if i'm always depressed and then how much happiness do i owe myself and then mm -hmm. people who sacrifice for me to be happy and my children like it, it 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 and i'm not saying i have a definitive answer um it's tough right um and i can't i feel like you feel as well though we say blessed about things that I just, uh, you know, I, I kind of prefer to call it luck. Yeah. But you know, it's like this, George, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. That is like, true. <laughs> I, like I, I remember coming from one of my trips and being in an area where water was very scarce. Yeah. And, I, and, 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 uh, you know, I saw these kids. Well, if I'm being honest, you know, like I got upset cause I, I was in this hotel and then I, my, I, something happened and then my hot water heater wasn't working mm -hmm. and I had to, I had to survive a cold shower. Right, 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 and I, right, right. And then I look out my window, and these kids are playing with a dirty pail of water, washing each other. They're maybe six and seven having a blast. And I felt ashamed of who I was. Yeah. Okay. And then I went to other areas where people have to decide what to do with that water. Do I cook with it, clean with it, or do I wash with it? And then after that trip, I come back to rest in Virginia, and I'm going to the movies with my nieces and some family. And in a beautiful summer day, and off in the distance, I see kids playing in a water fountain. And all I could think to myself was that we're so wealthy, we can play with the life resource. We use water and chemicals to make our grass in front of our homes look beautiful so that they're more marketable so that we can earn money. We think it's a good idea to put chemicals into the ground to make the square footage in front of our home look nice. <laughs> and then we sit out there with hoses and sprinklers for that. I, I, I'm not saying we should put it into that system but you can't it, it causes cognitive dissonance it causes tremendous yes. cognitive dissonance and and it's 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 fundamentally a distribution problem how can we have water fountains here and a scarcity of water in another country we have enough we just can't get it in the right people's hands yeah well i wonder if we can well no i hope we can i mean that's what we're all tilting at right I wonder if it's a matter of whether we can or whether we choose not choose not to that's a, that is a larger discussion there, but um, I think that um, going back to one of your original points is that as artists, I just think we need to broaden, um, broaden our minds in terms of all the ways that we can be creative, mm. create with and for other people. You know what I mean? I do. Um, and so the model that the music industry has created um, is great. It's produced great art, but it also narrows a person to say, "I have to be a brand, yes. not a man." Yes. And and I, if, if 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 coming out as Mikey and this Afro flow works, then I got to stick to that now. So that means I have to dress a certain way. I got to talk a certain way. I got to make certain music. I cannot explore right. other genres of music that have inspired me. Right. And there's a formula to this whole thing, and that's what we've kind of been conditioned to see. And then we see when artists want to stretch out of that, only a handful can truly be successful doing that. You know? I do. Mike, 
I, I don't, I mean, I could talk to you all day and you, you make me think in ways that I just, I'm embarrassed that I haven't thought of before. Your work is so important. Your art is so important. And I just, I, my, my respect for you is off the charts. Thank you so much for this. Oh man, I, I, I appreciate it. And you know, Hey, maybe we can collaborate and, uh, get some of these artists that I'm talking about together and, 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 and tour the world and, be ambassadors for this balance we're looking for. It would nothing would make me happier. Thank you again. All right, let's do it. All right.